Willkommen alle zusammen. Loki, you all have been asking about this one for a while, continuing the series where we go over the translations, symbolism and true meaning behind the Norse gods and myths. This is going to be a long video, I'm going over all the sources and explaining the attestations and what Loki really is, what he symbolizes and represents. What's the big deal with Loki? People, it's only ever Americans by the way, in the kind of new age millennial Gen Z area of pagans, but any other pagan groups or communities that I've come across in my life in Scandinavia or Europe or anywhere else, they don't have this. But online, in these online American pagan groups, tons of people just obsessed with Loki, praying to Loki, working with Loki, worshipping Loki, or oh, Loki is my patron god. Can someone please tell me where this all came from? Really, I'm asking out of interest, I'm not trying to make fun, I just have no clue where this all started and what brought all these people to Loki. Because we have a grand total of zero records and evidence that Loki was ever worshipped, prayed to, or venerated in any form uh, previously in history. Why would anyone want to worship Loki? I don't know. I think the origin of this maybe started in the 1970s USA area when a lot of these various like Wicca or even satanic or occult groups started to make their way into the Norse religion. And they saw Loki as like an evil personification of chaos? I don't know, am I on the right track? Is this where it started or has it become, you know, modern people obsessed with Loki because they are a bit like an outcast like Loki and they feel connected to him? Or is it the whole modern Disney representation of Loki and, you know, uh, Loki taking it up the bum by a horse and that resonates with some people. So please, if you guys have any explanation as to why Loki became such a big thing, um, let me know because I just don't understand it. Um, but what Loki represents is actually very simple. Loki is the catalyst. And if people have done their reading on the theories and the scholarly interpretations of the myths, pretty much everyone is on the same page that Loki in some way represents the catalyst. And I'll put a link to all those sources um, down below in the description. There have been other theories um, over the past 100 years or so, noting Loki as like a trickster god, um, like it's typical in other mythologies too, or Loki even as a god of fire, which is actually not far off from what I'm going to talk about, or just Loki being kind of a demonic force invented by the Christians um, in the Prose Edda. Um, there's some sources that have different theories on Loki, but they fail to go in depth and to explain the functions and all the attestations of Loki. Um, there have been a few modern authors though in the past 40-50 years, and they've kind of all they have slightly different um, opinions on it and, and ways they explain it, but they all kind of come to the general consensus that Loki is the catalyst, Loki is the instigating force of change in the world, the universe, everywhere. And a lot of uh, interpretations vary um, on the gods from author to author and they fight like crazy amongst each other, but Loki is actually one of the few that most people can come to an agreement on, that Loki is the force in the universe that instigates uh, change. The catalyst is the best English word we have to describe it, um, and Snorri Sturluson even wrote this, that Loki is the mover of stories. That's why Loki is actually in uh, more myths than most of all the other gods besides maybe uh, Thor. Any significant change in the universe, nature, our own bodies, life and even death, Loki is the force that is behind that, that sparks it off, that starts it. Does that make us atheists? No, all the gods aren't real, they're symbolic, blah blah blah. No, it makes us animist, remember. The belief that everything has a certain energy or spirit, the people, animals, trees, plants, the, the world as a universe as a whole actually, even natural phenomena and intangible things, ancient humans believed to have some sort of spirit or consciousness. We all believed in this animism if we go back far enough in time. This natural phenomena or intangible thing is exactly what Loki is, um, but something our modern minds are going to be so disconnected from, from our animus roots, we have a very difficult time understanding in the modern day. What is this cataclysmic force, this deep power that is there, that sparks and instigates change at the very root of everything that exists? 
No modern language is going to be able to describe that power accurately, but onto the sources, and I'm going to give it my best shot at explaining this uh, so everybody can understand. First, as always, on to the translation and etymology. Um, we are a bit unsure and it's debated, but um, a common one that scholars have suggested is that it comes from the Germanic word, uh, root word, look, meaning some sort of knot or hook or it's connected to it, something like that. Another translation is that uh, Loki could be connected to the Old Norse word logi, meaning flame, fire, or blaze. And Loki could be like little fire or little blaze, like a spark or an ember. Loki is also referred to in the sources sometimes as Loptir, which is generally considered to be derived from the Old Norse word uh, Lopt, meaning air. Um, look at that um, word for him. It is uh, flame or spark, and the other one of his names means air. And I think this is 100% key, and it explains everything, and I cover that at the end of the video, but for now, uh, on to the sources. Uh, first one, I'll go over these first, um, uh, in case someone finds these. Uh, I kinda, maybe, a little lied when I said we have no records of Loki ever being worshipped. It's true, we don't have any records of Loki being worshipped, we definitely don't have any evidence of that from pagan times, what we have is an invocation of Loki in two much later texts and grimoires. Here is a little spell from England that was recorded in the 1800s actually, invoking Odin and Loki in a quick little incantation. Uh, of course, I don't expect this one is very old at all, and I don't expect that they knew what the heck they were talking about in the place this was recorded in Lancashire, England at the time, but it's an interesting source either way. Um, another one is quite a bit older. It comes in the Galdera book from Iceland, which is a grimoire dating to about the late 1600s. <laughs> it's a uh, fart spell, it's called, uh, called Fart Runes, to make an enemy uh, fart or shit himself <laughs> one part says that you must become as weak as Loki as all the gods uh, snared him. Okay, that's still late and I don't expect the ones who wrote this um, uh, knew what they were talking about here either, um, but at least they do show some knowledge of the mythology uh, of Loki being um, binded away by the gods, which was a story probably not told uh, for a few hundred years in Iceland by that time. So I just went over those sources. Um, it's not worship. But I do consider those a little invocation, so I can't really say that Loki was never venerated until uh, modern times, but you can you can see the difference. I uh, just had to go over those quickly. So first, the mentions of Loki in the Poetic Edda. This is the most reliable, most of you know, but this is the uh, oldest poems and sources that we can be pretty sure most of them were composed in pagan times, uh, so they're going to be the most reliable. First, we have uh, Fjörvinsmål. Uh, not much about Loki here, except he is mentioned as Lopter, and he, re, uh, he used runes to keep the magic wand, Lavatain, locked away in a chest with nine locks. So this really is the only mention of Loki somehow being connected to locks, as, have, as some have suggested his name uh, could be connected to. Next poem here, we have uh, Hindeljod, uh, very important. This one goes into depth about Loki's children. First, it says Loki ate the heart of um, a stone uh, a stone of a woman. We have no idea what that refers to. That's not attested anywhere else. Uh, but then Loki here bangs the giantess, um, referred to as a wicked woman here, but uh, the, the real name is uh, Angerbo, though. We know that is um, uh, the mother of Loki's three children, but only two of them are listed here, and that is Fenrir and Hel, even though their names aren't listed either. Um, uh, they are referred to with kennings. Uh, so Hel represents both death and the realm of the dead, that's easy, you all know that. Fenrir is a lot more difficult, um, but this wolf uh, represents some sort of destructive force uh, that brings about cold and death and winter and the young Lyric and the death of all things. I spoke about Fenrir more in my video on Vida that you can check out. And I'll go into Fenrir in depth in the next video when I do one on the Ragnarok. Uh, but for now, you get the idea. Now, Angerboda, uh, Loki's baby mama, <laughs> she is very mysterious. Her name means the one who brings grief, or she who offers sorrow, um, or harm bitter, something like that. 
So pretty easy when you mix Loki, the catalyst, the instigating force of change, and mix it with Angerboda, the bringer of sorrow, it makes sense that their offspring is Hel, which is death, and Fenrir, the cold death uh, bringer, um, and Ragnarok uh, bringer, and then the third one, uh, the serpent, Jörmungandr, which is the border in between realms and dimensions. They are all in the very negative, uh, sorrowful uh, things that uh, come about with change. Okay, so look what happened though when Loki makes a child with someone else. Svadilfari, a giant horse. When Loki changes into a mare and he takes it up the bum and gets impregnated and gives birth to Sleipnir, the greatest of all horses. Sleipnir we're actually very sure about um, and he represents the force that makes our soul uh, slip uh, in and out of our body. This is what Sleipnir's name means, the slippery one or the sliding one. And there are parallels to Sleipnir uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, Siberian shaman Nevzum has the most detailed explanation of this eight-legged horse, um, but there, there's other places in the world too that have this, this same concept. Um, so Loki isn't just a catalyst for negative changes all the time, sometimes he instigates positive changes. Next is uh, Baldur's Dreamer, the poem. Uh, Baldur's uh, dreams. Uh, Odin uh, wakes up a um, Völva who is uh, dead and in hell, and he asks her questions about his son's Baldur's bad dreams, and she gives prophecy. And Loki is mentioned in stanza 14, where the Völva tells Odin to ride home, be proud of yourself, you did it, and no one else will come visit. Yeah, no one else from Hel will come visit the Earth until Loki is loose and escaped from his bonds, and that is when Ragnarok uh, will begin. Okay, that's also easy. Um, if Loki remains uh, chained up, Ragnarok will not come. If this uh, catastrophic change will not happen, uh, the one who causes that change is locked up, so therefore it cannot happen. And here, um, there may have once been a ritual, actually, that humans really did symbolically to bind this cataclystic force that is Loki in order to prevent uh, Ragnarok. By maybe doing some sort of knot work or like tying chains around a temple, both things that we know the Norse did, or maybe symbolically tying up a statue or idol of Loki. Um, that These are things that all cultures did around the world, similar things. Um, but I'll go a bit more into that later on in the video. Then we have uh, Jägen's Mull. Uh, this poem is very difficult because it's one of the heroic poems and it's semi-historical about real humans that may have lived in the 5th century-ish. Uh, and most of you know this one uh, where the uh, otter named Uther is fishing and Loki kills the otter and he takes his fish and Loki makes a bag out of the otter's pelt. Later on he meets the otter's family and they turn out to be dwarves and they demand compensation for the, the son and brother of so the otter's death. Then Loki goes out and he acquires some gold to pay them. He acquires the cursed gold and gives it to the family and the brother of Uther, Regin, is the one who the treasure actually goes to, and Regen is the dragon that uh, Sigurd um, eventually slays later on in the story. Uh, so guys, the symbolism in this is is too much. Uh, I have to go into what dwarves are, which will take an hour, and then this story kind of blends symbolism with reality and potential real events. It's no time to go over in this video, but I'll do another. But you get the point. Uh, you get again, Loki is the catalyst that puts all these things into motion. Next, one of my favorites, um, Thrymskrida. The story where Thor loses his hammer, Mjölnir, and the giant Thrymir, the king of Jotunheim, um, the, the giant's uh, realm, he steals Thor's hammer and buries it far beneath the earth, and he says he will only give Mjölnir back if the gods promise him Freya as his wife. Uh, so Thor dresses up as Freya, a famous story, and he goes to Jotunheim and he brings Loki along to... Uh, uh, get married to uh, Thrymir. Last minute though, he breaks out of the wedding dress and takes the hammer and smashes all the giants. So this one is pretty easy too, guys, and it's all explained in great detail in Vegai Sulheim's book, uh, among other authors too have covered this in uh, some detail. 
This is a story about when we're dead, um, and when all things die, and how we get reborn, reincarnated. Um, go watch my videos I did on Thor and Mjolnir, and I explain this in depth, but um, Thor is the life force in all living things, and also the protective barrier, the protection of that life um, in all living things, humans, animals, plants, the world as a whole. Mjolnir is the driving power of that force. In humans, that's our heart, or the heartbeat, it's like Mjolnir, um, our heartbeat is lost um, when the giant steals it, and then Thor can no longer function. Our life force is still there, but it's very weakened, it's when we are dead. Thor needs to retrieve Mjolnir from Jotunheim. Now the Jotun, uh, they are the devouring forces in nature, the giants are the devouring forces in nature, and the universe, that's what their name actually means, it means devourer. So the king of the giants is trying to devour our life force permanently, in order to prevent that from happening, Thor has to disguise himself as Freya in uh, the wedding dress, in order to get Mjölnir back. Freya represents the egg, okay? It's just like each and every single one of us. The life force that we start every life with, the life force in the sperm or the seed. Thor is not the sperm, Thor doesn't represent the sperm. Uh, Freyr is symbolic and represents the sperm or the seed. That's what Freyr's name uh, means if we go back far enough. I did a video, a full one on Freyr. Thor is the life force in that sperm, in that seed. And it's at its most weakened and minimal form of life, but it's still living. It has to enter the egg, aka disguise itself as Freya, in order to get Mjölnir back, aka the heart and heartbeat. And then life can be achieved um, uh, once we do that and we can be reborn. All this story, Loki, of course, accompanies Thor, because Loki is the force of all major change in the universe and our own bodies. Uh, of course, life and death is a big change, so the energy of Loki has to always be present there. That's a quick summary, but again, um, you can check out Vega's book um, uh, for a, the best explanation on that. Next we have Luca Senna, my favorite, which is pretty much just a poem about Loki talking shit to all the gods. Very entertaining. And a lot of symbolism here, um, lots of characters, all the gods, even elves, um, aka the ancestral spirits, they're getting together at a feast in Agatha's Hall. This again will take a couple hours to explain the meaning behind every stanza in Lucas and that, but uh, the important part is where the gods bind Loki after. Uh, but two things first. Uh, before I go on, um, in Lucas and the gods are at Agatha's house for a feast. Hagit is a giant, uh, but very clear that he is a personification of the sea. I wonder why? Oh yeah, because his name actually means sea, and also his alternative uh, name, Hler, also means sea. Um, so at this feast is an event after Baldr dies. Baldr's death is a myth about the summer dying and winter coming. The gods need to bring Baldr back to life, or else Ragnarok is going to come and we're all dead. So Ragnarok started off by three, win uh, three years of winter, as most of you know. When it's winter and cold in the north of Europe, everything is dead. There is nothing to eat, there is nothing living, and we will all die too without food very soon. So to survive, where must we go? To the sea. To fish. It's just like the gods go to Agir, the sea. They go to him for a feast. And in Agir's hall, interestingly enough, they, um, the scholars have connected to a place called Lasher in Old Norse. It was uh, Hler's Island, um, which is another name for Agir. This is a real place. It's a remote island off the coast of Denmark. Incredibly old and sacred. Um, I haven't been there, but I will someday, and I'll tell you more when I do, just to just see what I can find, and I'll do another video on just Agir. Next point of Lokasenna, important to bring up, um, uh, Loki kills a servant as soon as he gets into the hall, and he starts talking shit, and all the gods chase him out, and they don't allow him in. Loki tries to come back in, and the gods say, get lost, uh, but Loki brings up an oath that Odin once made to him long ago. That they were blood brothers, and Odin said that he would never drink ale unless it were brought to both him and Loki. Okay, so you guys have seen me do a few videos on uh, Odin. 
Odin's name literally means the frenzied one or the raging one, um, or in oldest times, a lord of the possessed. That's exactly what Odin is. It's the frenzied energy in us humans. It's the fight or flight or adrenaline or trance state, whatever you want to call it. There, there's no modern word in, in any language to describe it. The spirit of Odin. Um, Odin is believed to possess us in the states of trance, um, ecstasy, meditation, war, shamanic ritual, those kinds of things. And many myths uh, surrounding Odin actually do reflect very real rituals and events that humans practiced while in this frenzied state of mind. In order to uh, achieve uh, this altered state of consciousness, some sort of change is required, right? Hence why Loki is always around Odin and why Odin can never have a drink without Loki. Uh, so we need Loki's cataclysmic force of change to get into those uh, states of consciousness, that state of Odin. Um, so possibly this is yet another piece of evidence that uh, humans consumed some sort of ritual intoxicating drink to get to these altered states and that's why Odin and Loki always uh, drink together. And finally, after Loki um, uh, talks shit to all the gods for a while and pisses them all off, Thor comes in and Loki keeps uh, roasting Thor too. And Thor uh, keeps saying over and over again, shut up or I'm going to crush you with Mjolnir. Shut up, shut up. He keeps saying it over and over again. And Loki eventually leaves because Thor with Mjolnir is the only one of the gods that Loki uh, fears. So why is this? Why does Loki, this cataclysmic force of change, fear Thor and Mjolnir above anyone else? Which is the life force, the heartbeat, and I, I don't know. I haven't read any good theories on why this is, um, and I haven't been able to figure that one out myself either. So I would love to hear what you guys think about it. If you have any theories, why would the instigating force of change be frightened by the life force and heartbeat? Um, but then, uh, eventually, finally, Loki leaves, and later on, the gods decide to hunt him down. Loki takes the shape of a salmon, and then the gods catch him. They tie him up with the entrails of his son, Nadi, which turn into iron chains after. And then Skali ties a snake over Loki, where he is tied up, and it drips venom onto him. But Loki's wife, Sigyn, uh, would sit with Loki forever with a bowl that poison dripped into. But when the bowl is full, she has to carry it away and dump it. And then Loki gets some drips of poison onto him, and then he screams with such violence that the whole earth uh, shakes whenever this happens. And those are uh, earthquakes, uh, as referred to in here. Um, and Loki would remain in this state tied up until Ragnarok when he escapes. Uh, so all that part I don't have an answer for either, and I have not read any compelling theories. Um, let me know if you guys have any, uh, but for me, I think there's some sort of ritual in there uh, that humans did to prevent Jean Lodrick. Like, humans maybe did a mock performance of their gods and mythology to get the results that they wanted. This is what we call sympathetic magic, and all humans did things like this if we go back far enough. Um, so maybe some sort of ritual taking place at the midwinter, for example or something where they got a statue of Loki or an idol and they tied it up somewhere or maybe they went fishing and picked a salmon to sacrifice, I don't know. Um, or maybe they just kind of uh, picked some asshole guy at the <laughs> midwinter feast who was causing all the problems just like Loki was and they tied him up and sacrificed him just like they did Loki. Um, keeping the problem members of society out and killed him, this is what human sacrifice was all about. They weren't just sacrificing innocent victims in the village. Maybe they even kept him tied up with iron chains too, just like in the story. Like iron, we know, wards off um, spirits or kind of at least inhibits uh, spirits to function. Um, that's uh, suggested in the Eggya runestone and also later on sources from the uh, folklore. So symbolically binding this cataclysmic force uh, of change that is Loki uh, with uh, 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 iron. That prevents his spirit from escaping and therefore prevents uh, Ragnarok. Uh, or there's another potential ritual to prevent Ragnarok. Maybe we carved images of Loki chained up just like we see here on a couple of runestones. 
uh, here uh, those are believed to be depicting Loki and you see this is pretty much the only single piece of evidence uh, that we have of Loki ever being brought up in any sort of religious practice um, but as I mentioned before not worshipped why the heck would anyone worship Loki to bring about Ragnarok but eventually Loki does get out he escapes from his change and that is when Ragnarok comes this brings us to our final source in the Poetic Edda, Völuspor. Not much info given there except Loki is free when Ragnar comes and he steers his ship with all the bad guys who are coming to uh, go to war with the gods. So that's about it guys, not much info given there. We just went over the whole Poetic Edda. Thankfully we have uh, another source about the gods and mythology and that um, uh, it just expands on all the sources that I went over in the Poetic Edda, and that's the Prose Edda. Just be aware that the Prose Edda was written by Snoddy, a Christian, a couple hundred years after official pagan times, and it's not going to be the most reliable. Uh, we have many parts of the Prose Edda that actually contradict the info given in the much more reliable and older uh, Poetic Edda, so we know it's not all accurate and reflecting original pagan belief and mythology, but it's still very valuable, and the main, uh, the main uh, plot of the stories is still the same. We just can't get too caught up in details and in the Poetic Edda, that, that just giving you a warning there. So we had a very good question on the Patreon group. Uh, was Loki just an invention by Snorri um, and brought into the prose era? Uh, or does Loki go back further, all the way back to the Viking Age and even before that, the Germanic tribes? Uh, so no, Loki is definitely not just an invention of Snorri, even though some scholars have proposed that and haven't, they haven't been doing their reading, because we find Loki also mentioned in the... Poetic Edda, some of the oldest poems in the Poetic Edda. Um, Hedegen's Mull is one of the oldest ones, dating back to the early Viking Age, we think, based on the language and style used, but Hedegen's Mull and all the other heroic poems, uh, remember, and, and also Völsunga Saga, is primarily a story about the Burgundians, a Germanic people that settled in modern-day France in the three and four hundreds. So, uh, yes, it's very possible that Loki dates back to the Germanic tribes long before the Viking Age, uh, although that's the only evidence um, we really have of Loki being even known about uh, before uh, Viking Age. Anyway, um, on to the first part of the prose edda, uh, Gilfagenni. Loki is called by some as the ass's uh, calumniator, and also all of these, <laughs> you know, kennings, the disgrace of all gods and men. And it also mentions here Loki is the son of the male uh, giant, uh, the Forbauti. And his mother is Laufi, or Nol, as she is referred to. And his brothers are Helblindi and Bileister. So Loki's father, Fordbauti, uh, has been translated as Dangerous Striker, or Sudden Striker. Uh, and Loki's mother, Laufi, has been a bit debated, but generally believed to be um, derived from the Norse word Lauf, meaning leaves or foliage. Uh, she is also uh, called Norl in some uh, sources, and that means needle. Okay, so some scholars have equated Loki's father, Dangerous Striker, to being a personification of lightning or even a flintstone. And Loki's mother um, represents leaves, foliage, or even needles, pine needles. So what happens when you put those two together? They make Loki. They make a Logi, a spark, ember. Uh, flame. So you guys see again this connection to fire. Loki is the small spark that is created and can build into a roaring blaze, bringing change, sometimes a good change, um, uh, like life and ecstatic trance and uh, other things that I spoke about that are good that Loki brings, but usually bad things come, like roaring wildfires. It's pretty heavy symbolism in there, um, and definitely there are probably better ways to explain it than what I'm doing, but I think we're on the right track, and that theory was written by uh, Axel uh, Koch um, in the 1900s, which was a Swedish uh, uh, philologist. 
What else? Um, Loki's brothers are Helblindi, meaning hellblind, and Bileister, uh, which we think means um, uh, storm relieving or a storm flasher or violent storm, something like that. Okay, so you can see how all that fits in with Loki's family. Although the brothers are barely attested anywhere else, and we can't get a clue of exactly what they uh, represent or what their function is. Loki also has three children. Uh, listed in more detail in the uh, Prose Edda. I went over these earlier. Um, the uh, Giantess Ungidboda, the Grief Bringer, the Sorrow Bringer, and Loki and her got together and made children Hel, which is the Death Underworld, Fenrir, which is the Bringer of the Cold and Death or Winter or something like that, so we're not quite sure. And then Jormungandr, Great Staff, or Great Magic, directly uh, translated, which refers to the borders in between realms and between dimensions. I went over all this earlier and did a video on Jormungandr and Hed. So Loki's um, other child, Schleitner, has mentioned, of course, we went over that. Um, that it's the force that brings our soul in and out of our bodies. So you guys how, uh, see how these can all be a product of Loki, the instigating force of change, pretty easy. Then we have the tale of when Thor, this is my favorite, when Thor traveled to Uthgard, the outer world or outer uh, realm. He travels there with Loki, and it tells about their dealings with uh, Uthgard, Loki, and Logi. Uh, in the famous battle of trickery that you have probably all heard that story before. So, Uthgard Loki is the Loki of the outer world. Exactly what that means, I don't know. Um, and I haven't read any compelling theories as to what that might be, this cataclysmic spark of change in the outer world, but it's kind of a parallel to Loki from some other dimension, it seems like. I don't know, uh, but it's very clear, it's different to Loki in this source. But anyway, Uthgar Loki is a giant king, and he uses his magic to trick Thor, you know, Thor wrestling the old woman that is a per personification of old age, and making Thor drink from a horn that drains directly to the sea. Um, very easy to connect Thor as being the life force there. Um, long story with lots of symbolism explained, again, beautifully by Veigide in his book. I won't go into that here, um, that part, but I'll tell about Loki in this story. Um, Loki's competition with Logi. Loki says that he can out-eat anyone there. He's a big eater. And there's a little giant boy around named Logi, and he agrees to the eating competition. Loki does a great job. He devours all the meat. But Logi, he eats all the meat, he eats all the bones, and even the plates on the table. So what does that young giant boy Logi mean? I don't know, probably exactly what his name means, <laughs> fire or blaze. And the giant Uthgadar Loki himself tells us at the end that the boy Logi is the personification of fire. Man, to the people who still think the gods and myths aren't symbolic, you guys should just ask them what they have been reading. The these tales and symbolism is taught to every kid in kindergarten in Norway. So Loki would never out-eat Logi, because again, Logi, again, some sh shows some sort of personification of this little spark or ember. But Logi is the fire or the roaring blaze itself. Um, uh, hoping I'm being clear, explaining the connection um, to what Loki really represents, which is the catalyst and how this connects to the spark, this instigating force behind the change. Loki is just this little spark, right? That just caught. It's not a fire yet. But that little spark is to a roaring blaze what a brand new born baby is to a fully grown adult. Sometimes that little spark that is Loki, it can grow into something positive and bring a good change. Uh, like Loki has also done sometimes. But uh, usually when it's left uncontrolled, it can grow into a wildfire and burn the whole world down. So Loki uh, is not the change itself. Loki does not represent change. Just like Loki isn't the fully grown blaze. Just like he can never eat as fast as the fully grown blaze, Loki. Loki is just that instigating force, that little starting force that instigates everything. The spark that puts it all in motion. 
which if you notice, Loki actually doesn't make all these bad things happen in the myths. He doesn't do all these bad things himself. He just instigates it, and usually it's someone else doing the uh, bad, uh, catastrophic thing in the myths. And I think it's really a beautiful and genius way to compare the cataclysmic force to a spark um, that our ancestors came up with. So really, I get blown away all the time. One final thing in the prose era. Heimdall and Loki always have some sort of quarrel and scuffle in the mythology, but at the Ragnarok, Heimdall and Loki fight each other and they end up killing each other. I don't know what that is all about, I can't explain it as of now, but I can tell you Heimdall's name means something like Great World or Home Valley or something like that. And we think he represents something very, very old and very, very sacred, some sort of universal consciousness or spirit. Um, some scholars have even uh, connected Heimdall to the wind just as his name means. Um, uh, some of his names he is referred to as, uh, like you can see here. So that's about it. I'll leave you with one more source. Loki actually did survive long into history it seems. Uh, in the 1800s there were a few sayings recorded in remote villages in Denmark that referred to Loki. Um, and this was a time where the folklore had not quite re-emerged from the old pagan uh, sources quite yet. So we think these are sayings that survived for 800 years after Denmark became uh, Christian. Um, it says Loki um, uh, sows his oats today or Loki herds his goats today. And these sayings refer to the fields and the farms in the spring when it is warming up. Uh, snow melting and it's steaming up just like a firewood over a kettle. Uh, so again, this connection to a spark and fire 800 years after these stories were told out in the open. So um, pretty interesting if that survived that way in kind of remote areas of Denmark. So that's all I have to say for today. How long is that video? Yeah, too long. I don't, uh, I enjoy making these videos, I really do, but I don't uh, enjoy doing the research because they take a very long time and they are definitely not worth it for <laughs> what uh, what we get back from it um, uh, if a lot of people don't watch it. So if you like these videos, share them around, get more people to view it. Um, that's why I do it. I do this to spread. I don't do it for anything else. I do this to spread knowledge and ideas and also get you guys thinking so we can all put our heads together and fill in the blanks. Um, but uh, yeah, if you like these and they start to get better views, I'll do these videos a lot more often. Um, but uh, that's all for today. We see us next time.